If you want to learn the high yield ways endometrial cancer is tested by examiners and do questions to test your knowledge on endometrial cancer, let's begin. Hi, I'm Dr. LJ from MD Powerhouse. Endometrial hyperplasia is a precursor to endometrial cancer. Endometrial hyperplasia causes increased thickness of the endometrium and it can contain cells with a low potential for malignant transformation or it can contain cells that are high risk for malignant transformation to endometrial cancer. Endometrial cancer occurs when malignant cancer cells appear in the endometrium. It typically occurs in peri or postmenopausal women. The type of endometrial cells seen on biopsy dictates the best treatment for patients that we will discuss later in this video. First, we have to discuss risk factors for endometrial cancer and the types of endometrial cancer. There are two types of endometrial cancer. Type 1 is estrogen dependent and it is more common in real life and more common on the birds as well. It is the endometrioid subtype. This will be the main focus of this video. However, we have to mention type 2. So type 2 is estrogen independent and it is called the serous type. It is less common but more aggressive. It occurs due to a mutation in the P53 tumor suppressor gene. Questions about risk factors are a favorite for the Step 2 CK exam and the upgyne shelf. Excess estrogen is the major risk factor for the development of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. Some risk factors include obesity, nulliparity, hormone replacement therapy, estrogen therapy, early menarche or late menopause. Another risk factor for endometrial cancer and endometrial hyperplasia is chronic anovulation, which is where there is unopposed estrogen secretion. For example, this occurs in patients with PCOS. At the end of this video, we will do questions to test how well you understand these risk factors and how they can lead to endometrial cancer. Hormone replacement therapy is most commonly given to menopausal women. In menopausal patients with moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms such as hot flashes, the first line treatment is with hormone therapy. Patients with a uterus requires estrogen plus progesterone therapy. This decreases the risk of endometrial cancer associated with unopposed estrogen. However, patients without a uterus requires estrogen-only therapy, for example, a transdermal patch. As you can tell, progesterone counteracts the effects of estrogen. Clinical features of endometrial cancer is another key way of getting questions correct on this topic, the main one being postmenopausal bleeding. Other clinical features include heavy, prolonged intermenstrual bleeding, non-tender, irregularly enlarged uterus. Seeing such findings in a woman that is between the ages of 55 to 65 should make you think of endometrial cancer. A transvaginal ultrasound can be done to detect increased thickness of the endometrium. If the endometrium is less than 4 millimeters, then no additional evaluation is required. However, if the endometrium is greater than 4 millimeters, then this requires an endometrial biopsy to be done. A transvaginal ultrasound is beneficial in detecting endometrial hyperplasia. However, a transvaginal ultrasound cannot distinguish between endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. 
So the gold standard diagnostic test is endometrial biopsy, which allows you to examine if the cells are malignant or not. So now let's discuss some high yield points that can be easy points that you get on your exam or shelf. There are certain drugs that can either increase or decrease the risk of endometrial cancer. Oral contraceptive pills decreases the risk of endometrial cancer. Tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, also called a CIRM. CIRMs are competitive inhibitors of estrogen binding to estrogen receptors. CIRMs may have antagonist or agonist effects. CIRMs such as tamoxifen are used to treat breast cancer. It has antagonist effects on the breast. However, it has agonist effects on the uterus. So it increases the risk of endometrial cancer. Raloxifene is another CIRM. However, it does not increase the risk of endometrial cancer. We will discuss these drugs more in the upcoming video about breast cancer. But first, let's give you more bonus points for your exam. Side effects of CIRMs can appear on your shelf or on your board exam. As previously discussed, tamoxifen increases the risk of endometrial cancer and endometrial hyperplasia. However, you should also know that CIRMs, both raloxifene and tamoxifen, can increase the risk of hot flashes and venous thromboembolisms. The agonist effect of tamoxifen on the uterus can lead to endometrial hyperplasia or cancer. However, the agonist effects of CIRMs are not all bad depending on what tissue they act on. Tamoxifen and raloxifene are partial agonists in the bone, causing an increase in bone mineral density after menopause. A typical glandular cells on pap smear is normal in younger patients, specifically those less than 35. These cells are seen on pap smear depending on what stage they are at in their menstrual cycle. However, if atypical glandular cells are seen on pap smear in a patient older than 45, this is an indication for endometrial biopsy. Also, if a patient has abnormal uterine bleeding and is known to have Lynch syndrome, this is also an indication for endometrial biopsy. So let's do a quick review of Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome is also known as hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. It is an autosomal dominant disease that is characterized by a mutation in mismatch repair genes. This then leads to microsatellite instability. I remember the cancers that can be seen in Lynch syndrome using the mnemonic CEO. C, colorectal cancer, E, endometrial cancer, and O, ovarian cancer. So hopefully this visual and this mnemonic helps you to remember the cancers associated with Lynch syndrome. Now let's do some questions. So first, let's look at the last line. It says, what is the patient at greatest risk of developing? So this lets me know that it's possibly a two-step question where you'd have to first figure out what's the diagnosis and then find out what are some complications of that diagnosis. So let's read the question. It says, a 26-year-old woman presents to your office for evaluation of hirsutism. She has noticed acne and hair on her upper lip and chin. Menarche was at age 12 and menstrual cycles occur three to four times per year and last eight to nine days. Her BMI is 36. What is the patient at greatest risk of developing? This patient most likely has PCOS because the history demonstrates evidence of androgen excess with the acne and the hair on the upper lip and chin. Also, she has ovarian dysfunction possibly 
as she experiences menstrual periods three to four times per year. And her BMI suggests that she is obese. So the diagnosis is PCOS. The chronic anovulation seen in PCOS, as well as her BMI of 36, are both risk factors for endometrial cancer. The anovulatory cycle seen in PCOS results in chronic estrogen stimulation. So the answer is C. So question number two. The last line says, what is the most likely cause of the patient's chief complaint? So this is maybe a two or three step question where you have to know what the diagnosis is and then know the pathophase of it. A 53 year old woman presents to your office complaining of postmenopausal bleeding for the past four months. The bleeding is intermittent and light. Her BMI is 36. Transvaginal ultrasound reveals endometrial thickness of 5.2 millimeters. What is the most likely cause of the patient's chief complaint? The patient has postmenopausal bleeding and the transvaginal ultrasound reveals endometrial thickness greater than 4 millimeters. So this patient definitely has endometrial hyperplasia and possibly endometrial cancer. A major risk factor for these conditions is obesity, which this patient has. Her BMI is 36. So why is obesity a risk factor? This is because when a patient is obese, they have more adipose tissue. So this means that there is a more peripheral conversion of androgen to estrogen in adipose tissue which can lead to chronic unopposed estrogen exposure and uncontrolled endometrial tissue proliferation. So the answer is D. So now let's do some rapid fire questions that can be easy points for your exam. What is the most important prognostic factor for endometrial cancer? And the answer is the stage at diagnosis. What is the greatest risk factor for endometrial cancer? The answer is unopposed estrogen exposure. What is the drug of choice to treat patients with endometrial hyperplasia? And the answer is progestins. So let's talk about this question a bit more. Patients with endometrial hyperplasia are at risk for progression to endometrial cancer. However, progestin counteracts estrogen's effects by inhibiting endometrial proliferation. It's very important to note that progestin only can be the treatment if biopsy reveals that the cells have a low risk of progressing to cancer. However, if there are high risk cells seen on biopsy, or if the patient has already progressed to endometrial cancer, then the treatment is surgical with a hysterectomy. And now the last question of this video asks, which ovarian tumor can be associated with endometrial cancer? If you know what the answer is, Pause the video here and comment the answer down below in the comment section. Otherwise, let's see the answer. And it is granulosa cell cancers. So granulosa cells are ovarian sex cord stromal tumors that secrete high estrogen levels that increase the risk of endometrial cancer. To learn more about ovarian cancers, click this video right here. Also, if you like the content of this video, hit subscribe and power up that like button and tell us in the comments below what other videos you like to see.